Dean Richterman, Camera Florida and Midwest Region Director. Today's program was presented last month at our Florida annual season opening event, and we received such great feedback that we decided to make the program available to all our camera supporters. What can we expect from the media in 2021? First, please join me on a short nostalgic journey. I'm sure some of you, like me, remember when television news meant a half hour every evening at 5.30 or 6 o'clock. We could choose between CBS, ABC, and NBC. And most families got the local newspaper delivered right to their front doors. How things have changed. Today, most people get their so-called news from cable news outlets whose commentators see their role as political advocates rather than objective journalists. And the internet, where social media corporations decide what does and does not get communicated. These corporations censor information they deem hate speech or false information, posing a threat to pro-Israel communities. There are movements trying to brand Zionism as hate speech. And if those movements persuade the social media companies that defending Israel is a kind of hate speech, then organizations like Camera will be silenced on these channels. In fact, recently, when Twitter purged thousands of Twitter accounts, presumably for having the wrong political opinions, Camera lost over 4,000 followers in the space of only 24 hours. I'd like to go over a few logistics for today's program. During the presentations and discussion, everyone but the speakers and moderator will be muted. You can type your questions by running your cursor along the bottom of your screen and clicking on the Q&A icon. We'll try to take as many questions as we can. But please remember that camera is nonpartisan. We don't take positions regarding political parties or individuals. And we know that you, our camera supporters, represent a wide range of opinions. But we all know that we stand united in our support for Israel. Our keynote speaker today is Sorab Amari. Sorab was born in Iran and emigrated to the US at age 13. He's a columnist, editor, and author of nonfiction books and he's currently the op-ed editor at the New York Post, which itself experienced media bias by the mainstream media last fall. Previously, he served as a columnist and editor for the Wall Street Journal in New York and London, and a senior writer at Commentary Magazine. Sean Derns, camera senior research analyst, is responsible for monitoring 16 news outlets in the Washington DC area Previously, he worked for several Washington-based think tanks and a former Undersecretary of Defense. Tamar Sternthal is the Director of Camera's Israel Office. She's been a member of our staff for over 20 years, fighting anti-Israel bias around the world. Tamar currently spearheads Camera's monitoring of the international wire services. She manages Camera's Arabic website and she coordinates with Camera's Spanish department and Info Equitable, an independent media watch site working in French. Our program today will be moderated by Marv Schlanger. Marv is a lifelong advocate for the state of Israel, a longtime supporter of Camera, and a member of Camera's Florida Advisory Board and Executive Committee. Marv has frequently spoken about Israel and the Middle East to both Jewish and non-Jewish audiences, and he's a frequent camera letter writer. So now let me turn the program over to Marv Schlanger. Thank you, Nadine. And to our viewers and supporters, thank you for joining us today. And thank you for your support of camera. Uh, Saurabh, you are immersed in the world of communications. You are at the interface of the changes taking place in the press today. Tell us about your experiences and how these changes might relate to the coverage of Israel in the press. 
Well, uh, thank you for having me, Camera and Nadine and Marv. I'm glad to rejoin you for another uh, panel. I'm sorry that we couldn't all meet each other in person, but I look forward to doing that at some point, hopefully, God willing, sooner than later. Um, I want to talk about the New York Post's experience with um, social media censorship, which I'm sure most of you had heard of, but I want to give you kind of the inside track on what happened over the course of, I'll be brief, about 10 minutes, and then um, try to draw some wider conclusions that would apply to the pro-Israel community and other similarly situated communities and some ways forward that have been um, kind of shown to us recently uh, with respect to um, Australia's confrontation with Google and Facebook and the fact that the two giants finally backed down in the face of a, a sovereign government essentially trying to rein them in. Um, so I'll close on that very briefly. To tell you the story of uh, the New York Post, well, I mean, I'm sure all of you saw our reporting on the Hunter Biden files. Whoever you voted for in the 2020 election, um, I think the story I'll describe should disturb you. Um, uh, regardless of your own partisan affiliation or uh, ideological point of view. Um, so I won't go into the, the actual kind of what was in the story, which you can now you know, access. It's been out there and, and deeply reported. Um, but I'll tell you from our point of view, um, obviously I'm the op editor. I, I oversee our um, columnists and outside op-ed contributors. I was not involved in the reporting and editing of that story because that's a news story. Um, but over the course of these events, I sort of became, I emerged as the, as the face of the New York Post defending our coverage. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously we had obtained uh, uh, this hard drive, this cache of emails that appeared to be uh, involving uh, the now, uh, the new president's son. Um, and um, some of them were kind of salacious personal material, but the ones that were of interest to us, and I think of interest to the nation going into an election, um, involved um, Hunter's apparent dealings um, and apparent setting up of meetings between his father, then the second most powerful man in the world, and uh, you know, officials uh, associated with kind of Chinese and Ukrainian uh, conglomerates in the case of the Chinese state-backed conglomerate, conglomerates. Um, so our first story, which had to do with uh, uh, Hunter apparently setting up a meeting between um, his, his father and Burisma, the Ukrainian energy firm that was paying him at least $50,000 a month, appeared in mid-October at about five in the morning uh, that day. I saw it when it appeared online. I didn't know we were doing this. I saw it along with everyone else. Um, then at about um, 10 o'clock, a Facebook executive um, who also happened to work for, before joining Facebook, work for the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee uh, and uh, Senator Barbara Boxer's office. Uh, we know this because it's right in his bio. Um, this Facebook staffer said, we know that this you know, troubling and um, you know, uh, story has appeared in the New York Post. We think it deserves greater fact checking. And therefore we have taken steps to quote, reduce circulation on the story on our platform until further fact checking could be done. Um, let me just pause there and just say that that's a standard that uh, Facebook had not applied to countless other stories, including, you know, and, and especially a number of anti-Trump stories that appeared over the past four years that, that, that subsequently collapsed under factual scrutiny. For example, the claim that you know, the president had suborned perjury from Michael Cohen, which was reported by BuzzFeed and picked up by numerous other outlets. And then subsequently, uh, you know, the special counsel's office denied that story within 24 hours. But in the course of those 24 hours, when the BuzzFeed story appeared and the special counsel uh, uh, denied the story, essentially proved it to be false, Facebook did not take steps to reduce circulation on the BuzzFeed story. So we'll get to that. Then a, a couple of hours later, maybe one hour later, if I remember correctly, uh, we noticed that people couldn't post the story on Twitter either. When you tried to post that story, you got an error message. Um, uh, and then more ominously, I would argue, um, uh, you know, our readers couldn't uh, even share it in their Twitter direct messages. In other words, it was, you were barred from sending it privately to another follower as well. Um, 
And then we had our um, New York Post, our main New York Post Twitter account uh, suspended. It's at NY Post. Um, and the grounds that we were told by Twitter for the suspension was that we had posted hacked material um, against their policy on posting hacked material. Now, first of all, we maintain, and again, I don't wanna go into the mechanics of how we got the story because we've always been very transparent of how we got the email, but we maintained that this was not hacked material. This was uh, uh, you know, an email that Hunter Biden appears to have left at a Delaware laptop shop and forgot to take, uh, pick it up. And so the owner of that laptop store took what's called constructive ownership of the, of the laptop and therefore he had the right to disclose the material. He gave it to the FBI which is now part of an, uh, you know, federal probe into Hunter Fi Biden's activities and finances. And he gave, then gave it uh, another copy to partisan people, you know, uh, Rudy Giuliani's people who then turned it over to us. This was more uh, a transparent chain of custody compared to lots of other stories that again, did not get barred on the ground that they involved hacked material. Then the Twitter said, well, this was unauthorized release of material. Now, again, as you know, all journalism is more or less release of materials that other people don't want released. If only those things which people in power uh, wanted released were released as journalism, you wouldn't have journalism, you would only have public relations. Some of the greatest pieces of journalism from Abu Ghraib to, I don't know, the, the, the meatpacking <laughs> plants of, of, of Chicago at the turn of the 20th century, all of that involved releasing things that people in power or people with money didn't want disclosed. So that was a fatuous argument. And we stood by our, we stood our ground. And this is, I think, the lesson of this, um, that, uh, you know, a lot of our fellow reporters and others were urging us, look, just delete the initial tweets and regain access to your at NY Post uh, Twitter account. Because eventually, the CEO of Twitter, Jack Dorsey, admitted that this was mishandled and said, we've changed our policy. You can now post hacked policy as long as you yourself are not the hacked material, as long as you yourself are not the hacker. Now we maintain this was not hacked material to begin with, but at any rate, uh, we, we weren't going to uh, essentially subject ourselves to this uh, ex, ex post facto rule that we had to delete our tweet, then we could get our access to our account back because that would be an admission that we had done something wrong, that, that we had committed the crime of doing journalism. And as you can imagine, had we acquiesced as many people were urging us to do, um, what would have happened was that for ever after, critics of the New York Post would say, um, the New York Post, which had, had had to delete some of its tweets because you know, of, of accusations that it was hacked material, that would stay with us forever. So we felt it was important to stand by the truth. This was not hacked material. This was journalism. This was journalism that still remains undisputed to this day. Neither Hunter Biden nor President Biden disputes the authenticity of the emails or the provenance of the laptops. What they do is just broadly call it Russian disinformation without evidence. And we now know again that there's a federal investigation involving the material that we uncovered. So we believe that it would have been wrong for us to just acquiesce to this big tech bullying. So we stood our ground. Um, I can tell you that we, that that involved financial harm to us, financial cost to us, because obviously every day that went by where we couldn't access our Twitter account with its two million, however many followers, was a day where X number of readers weren't coming to our sites and therefore we weren't um, being able to offer ads. So our revenue went down. I won't mention the amount, but it was significant. Nevertheless, we insisted and eventually, you know, obviously there was congressional hearings, uh, a lot of lawmakers put pressure on, on Mr. Dorsey and Mr. Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook. Um, and one day they just backed down. I mean, Twitter just un unlocked our account without us having to delete our original tweets, which you can still find there. Um, so in a way it's, it's a kind of a happy ending, I suppose, though I should note that, uh, you know, obviously Again, we stand by our journalism and it remains undisputed, but uh, a large swath of people um, didn't get to see it. Whatever you think about the election, whatever you think about whether Biden should have won or President Trump should have won, that's besides the point. The fact is that this was a story of national interest involving public graft in front of a, a close relative of, the, of then uh, the leading, uh, one of the leading candidates um, and now the President of the United States. And 
as you know, a lot of people don't get their news in a systematic way anymore. They just open their devices, they kind of take a glance and whatever shows up. So if our story is de-circul- you know, decirculated by Facebook and it goes to the bottom of people's feeds, which is what the technique they use in Facebook's case, or in the case of Twitter, altogether deleted from the ether of the internet, then lots of people won't see it. Um, and that means that our, you know, our national debate ahead of an election was shaped by a few unelected, you know, Silicon Valley oligarchs and the and the kind of young wokesters who service them as, as programmers and so forth. Um, nevertheless, I mean, as far as the New York Post goes, we obviously we got a great deal of vin- sense of vindication in the fact that we got our uh, we stood our ground and and we didn't have to delete any uh, tweets. Um, what lessons can others draw from this? I mean, first of all, it's um, uh, uh, you know obviously. The New York Post, <clears throat> which fits into a wider media ecosystem of News Corp, you know, the uh, company that also, uh, uh, you know, uh, owns the Wall Street Journal and so forth. And then you have Fox News, which is a sister network of ours, although the ownership structure is complicated and we're not related directly. Um, we can fight. We can, we can stand up for ourselves. Um, the unfortunate thing is that, you know, a lot of ordinary Americans don't have the kind of resources or the wherewithal to mount these fights. So if they feel like censorship is coming and they may have their identities, online identities on which so much depends, their social lives, their social reputation, their friendships, um, they will sooner self-censor than speak the truth. And I think that's very uh, disturbing. Another lesson is, you know, uh, again, I think it threw into sharp relief the fact that, and, and this is my opinion, is I'm not necessarily speaking for the post, but my own judgment, um, but I think it's shared by some of my colleagues at least that, you know, the log that governs all this, and I'm happy to go into the sort of nitty gritty of it uh, uh, in the question and answer, but Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act assumed, which was enacted in 1996 before there was any Facebook or Twitter, assumed that, um, you know, these companies should be given the right to, to monitor and delete material that was obviously, you know, uh, either uh, uh, prurient, child pornography, you know, violent threats, um, but that otherwise they would act like platforms and not publishers. Um, but in fact, we see them increasingly act like they have their own worldview. They are publishers, just like the New York Post is, just like the New York Times is, just like the Washington Post is. And yet, you know, if we, the media, publish libel, we we're, we're, can be sued for libel. But because of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, these companies get a special carve out. They can act like publishers, but shirk all the liability that comes with being a publisher. And I think that this episode and others like it highlight that and suggest that we need to do something, including, in my belief, some sort of kind of political action, because they're acting like political actors. They're not just neutral platforms anymore, if they ever were. And the third thing, I think I'll just very briefly touch on the Australia issue, which is just a recent thing that happened in our world, which is that, um, you know, for a long time, uh, uh, you know, Australian uh, lawmakers were disturbed by the fact that, um, you know, Google News and Facebook could host our content. And yet, you know, the publishers, whether it's News Corp or the New York Times or the Australian papers or whatever, weren't getting any of that revenue. So Australia attempted to, you know, pass the law saying you have to have a kind of, you have to pay for content that you host. And Google complied, but Facebook initially didn't. And so it just blocked all Australian content, uh, as you know. And so that created a massive outcry for about a week. And now Facebook uh, kind of came to the table and negotiated a kind of agreement about how to um, uh, share uh, uh, revenue, as it were, with the media uh, uh, companies that provide the content. Um, so I won't go into the details of that, but all of that to say is that it is possible, it is possible to rein in these companies, um, both at the level of the activist, if you're willing to fight, at the level of the journalist, if you're willing to fight for the truth, and then at the political level where you know, there, a nation state can still bring some counterbalance to the overweening power of our new oligarchs and monopolists. So I'll stop there, but I look forward to discussing this with you all further. Thank you. Well, thank you, Saurabh, for uh, the, the facts and just a fascinating insight into what it's like to work in journalism today. Uh, Sean, you work in Washington, D.C., which some might consider the vortex of these competing forces. 
what's your perspective on what's going on with the press and how it might impact Israel? Uh, thanks, Marv. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you all for being here and for your support of CAMERA. Uh, Winston Churchill, uh, himself a former journalist, famously observed that the truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it, ignorance may deride it, but in the end, there it is. As an observation, this is true until, of course, the truth is no longer there, until it has been scrubbed and memory holds in our 21st century digital landscape. As so Rob noted, the digital public square is under attack. This means that debate and free thinking is under attack. I don't need to emphasize how important those values are, how much they underpin the American project, and how essential they are to liberal democracies. The other problem here is who decides what is truth? Uh, who are these gatekeepers? I recently reviewed the first volume of Obama's memoirs uh, entitled The Promised Land. Cameron had received a number of complaints about factual errors and omissions pertaining to Israel and the Middle East that were contained within the book. So accordingly, I invested an, a considerable amount of time conducting a very lengthy review, and subsequently I published an article which, piece by piece and line by line, refuted and corrected errors about Israel, Israeli history, Palestinian terrorist groups, and the peace process. Camera published our review. It was nonpartisan. It was measured and it was deeply sourced. I'd invite everyone to read it. It's at our site, www.camera.org. This was nothing new for us. Indeed, we previously refuted inaccurate claims made about Israel that were contained in Jimmy Carter's deflammatory book, Peace Not Apartheid. It's customary for organizations to pay social media companies like Facebook to promote posts either to target people who don't follow you or to gauge those who already do. So camera sought to pay Facebook to promote our review of Obama's memoir. Facebook declined, claiming that our review violated standards against racism. We had no means of petition, no means of redress. Facebook, which pretends to be a platform and not a publisher, was clearly doing otherwise, limiting what our own followers can see and doing so on grounds that are easily refutable. So this is part of the problem. Big tech is curtailing free speech. It is entrusting mid-level staffers, many of whom, as Sorab noted, uh, you could say have, they have the politics of the current campus. That is to say politics that are avowedly hostile to Israel. These staffers have a narrative and any facts or claims to the contrary must be debated. They must be erased. I should note as well, the problems that we are seeing with gatekeeping and big tech is an outgrowth of something that camera has been fighting for years, something which we have experience with. Uh, in another age, major U.S. news outlets had standards and ethics editors, or ombudsmen even. Yet in the last decade or two, these positions have been eliminated at most newspapers, depriving the means of redress and independent fact-checking. This has made cameras work even more critical. Indeed, the self-anointed fact-checkers in many of these outlets have a tendency to be guided by narrative themselves. For example, the Washington Post fact-checker Glenn Kessler. The Washington Post uh, one example, ran a misleading fact checker column which minimized and obfuscated on the Palestinian Authority's policy of paying for terrorism. They relied on questionable sources. The Post cited documentation that was provided by the Palestine Liberation Organization, formerly a U.S. designated terrorist group. Worse still, the Post cited research about, about Palestinian prisoners that was provided for by Defense for Children International Palestine, DCIP, a group which has links to U.S. designated terrorist group, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Um, so this is problematic. Trusting terrorist-linked entities for a fact check on terrorist payments is pretty poor journalism. But of course, uh, you know, Twitter didn't take it down. Uh, Facebook did not decline to pr not promote it. Uh, yet this fact check is what passes for objectivity. And it also drives policy. For those who don't know, congressional staffers compile what are called media briefing packets for their respective members of Congress, uh, thus impacting policy and legislation. So when the Washington Post and dozens, dozens of other news outlets write that Israel isn't vaccinating Palestinians, omitting that the Oslo Accords stipulate that to be the responsibility for the Palestinian Authority, or when they describe the anti-Israel boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement as being akin to the American civil rights movement, as opposed to a movement that seeks the end of the Jewish state, which BDS explicitly does, this then becomes a new truth. And that new truth could very well become new policy. Uh, I wanna close, uh, I'll keep this short with a, with a Churchill quote, uh, or since I opened rather with a Churchill quote, I'd like to close with the following observation. In the 1930s, the BBC, which was close with the British government of Neville Chamberlain, Stanley Baldwin, and other appeasers, censored Churchill for his views on Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. They had a de facto boycott of the politician. 
Churchill was guilty of what the establishment then deemed to be wrong think. The BBC was quite powerful back then, but thankfully it didn't have the monopoly that social media giants of today possess. So that's a scary thought. Uh, one only needs to look at Ayatollah Khamenei's Twitter page and what passes for fact checks about the so-called Iran nuclear deal to see that supporters of liberal democratic values from Washington, D.C. to Jerusalem have their work cut out for them. Um, with that, I'd like to turn over to Tamar, my colleague. Thank, thank you, Sean. Appreciate that. And uh, Tamar, uh, you live and work in Israel. Uh, what is your perspective from overseas? Thanks so much, Marv, and thank you to everyone who is joining in today. Um, I've spoken a number of times in webinars in recent weeks about how social media has degraded the quality of traditional media coverage, but really I've come to the realization that the situation is unfortunately much worse than that. Social media has put traditional media into a tailspin from which it cannot and will not recover. It has done so by destroying the traditional business model, which is based on ad revenue, as advertisers and readers alike have uh, flocked to the less expensive social media platforms. Um, and, and the business model has been replaced by one of reader revenue and philanthropy. Um, and the, the software of this new model is polarization as opposed to consumerism. Anyone who wants to dive deep into these issues, I highly recommend the book by a media researcher named Andrew Muir. And he wrote a, a very important book called Post-Journalism and the Death of Newspapers. Um, so that's really a medium term prognosis. Uh, that's where we're headed, the end of the era of journalism as we enter the period of post-journalism um, and after the death of newspapers, journalism at large as we know it will not, will not um, continue to, to exist. Uh, but the medium term prognosis, sorry, the, the short term, what is going on right now is that indeed the quality of coverage has been is significantly, I can't overstate how much it's been eroded. Um, in 2017, there was a smart column in the New York Times by, uh, by the columnist Farhad Manju, who observed that um, Twitter makes news dumber. It has created an a space where echo chambers thrive and as, Professors at the University of Oxford um, noted in a study, Twitter creates, um, it manufactures consensus, which means to make uh, the illusion of popularity around a figure uh, or, or idea. And it's, it's these illusions of popularity that drive coverage. And we had confirmation of this phenomenon from an insider, it was a really eye-opening interview in New York Magazine in 2016. Uh, with Ben Rhodes, who was a senior official in the Obama administration. And he was tasked with selling the controversial Iran nuclear deal to the American public. And he spoke about how the journalists that he is dealing with literally know nothing. The average age is 27. Um, Sean talked about how with budget cuts, a lot of fact checkers have been eliminated. Uh, ombudsman for newspapers and fact checkers have been eliminated. And also um, more experienced journalists have, uh, have opted for buyouts and they've been replaced by these younger um, colleagues who have a totally different conception of what is journalism and, and really have very little understanding. So uh, Ben Rhodes took advantage of this fact by creating what he called an echo chamber. Uh, overnight, all of these think tanks sprung up and he fed the messaging, which were then picked up by the journalists who took the, these messages to be independent confirmation of the information they, they were receiving from the White House, but it was all just the same source being reverberated around and amplified on social media. One of the um, NGOs that he mentioned in the interview was called Plowshares, which is an anti-proliferation -prolifer uh, uh, organization, which actually gives funding for media coverage and funded, it came out uh, a year later, an NPR report on the Iran affair and NPR had not disclosed this, um, this contribution, although it was a direct conflict of interest. And when it was exposed by the Associated Press to their credit, they did add that information to the report and uh, they did a thorough study and, and wrote about that. So journalists are not only drawing from Twitter, but they're also catering to Twitter. Um, with the proliferation of so many news outlets, Nadine spoke back to the era of, you know, we had the three major networks and the national newspapers, which were just in print. Now, you know, there, there are so many options. In the digital era, era we had all these digital publications like Vox and Vice, uh, 
uh, Daily Beast and so on and so forth to spring up um, and plus all the social media platforms. So everyone is competing to get readers' attention. They're doing this, as I said, with polarization. They're also doing it with sensationalism, turning to storytelling as opposed to reporting a fact. And we received, uh, there was a really stark example of this with the New York Times podcast series, which was released in 2018. And the New York Times promoted, publicized this series very heavily and won all kinds of journalism awards. It was called Caliphate. And it was about uh, the, the featured uh, character in this podcast was a Canadian, uh, I think Pakistani Canadian uh, who said that he had been a former fighter with, with uh, ISIS in Syria. And he described in the podcast the very gruesome executions, which he said he took place. Well, it came out um, in, the, in the last few months of, of 2020 that this individual was arrested by the Canadian authorities for a terrorism hoax. There is in fact no um, confirmation that he has ever even stepped foot in Syria. Um, and the New York Times was forced to relinquish many prestigious journalism prizes that it received for the podcast, including um, a Peabody Award. A journalist within the paper, Ben Smith, wrote about the fiasco and said that it's um, not an outlier of the New York Times coverage, but in fact, it was um, considered the, the uh, it, it il illustrates exactly what the New York Times is all about. And that is that the New York Times um, has has as 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 no longer a paper of record, but it's becoming a, a juicy collection of great narratives on the web and streaming services. Um, and, and and it's ironic, really, that the New York Times gave up the Peabody Award because I, I I was curious what are the criteria for a media outlet or a media report to receive this award, and the award description says nothing about factual accuracy or truth but it talks about story, storytelling, and, and narrative at least half a dozen times. So we see this is what is becoming the driving force um, of, of journalism or what used to be journalism as opposed, as opposed to um, getting the facts out, getting the truth out and, and adhering to professional standards of accuracy above all. And there's so much to be said on this, but I'll, I'll leave it there. So there's time for, for discussion. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tamar. We've had a few questions come in. Well, thank you to all our, all our panel members. We have a few questions that have come in. And as a reminder, if you do have a question, please click on the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and type in the question. And we'll try to synthesize them and get as many done as possible. Uh, the first question, there were several questions uh, that have come in regarding section 230. Um, do, do any of our panel members think that there's a possibility that Section 230 will be repealed or modified? And we'll start with Sorab on this. And mute. Um, so the short answer is, I think, um, no. Um, I think there are, uh, um, for, for different reasons, uh, both parties are are reluctant to tackle this. I think it should be tackled. I don't know what alternative is. There are many on the table, um, whether it's you know, creating a private right of action when um, uh, you know, users have been unjustly uh, censored uh, or, or repealing it altogether, essentially leaving them to the vagaries of, of, of libel law like any other. Um, uh, publisher like the post like you know New York Times or whatever um, but the bottom line is I don't I don't see how that could have come about because you know as you know on the one hand the Biden administration has a lot to thank big tech for and the you know, administration is is full of uh, alumni of big tech through and through um, you know alumni of Facebook alumni of Google now work in the in the Biden White House and then on the, on the Republican side, you have still, I mean, I think it's being challenged some, to somewhat, uh, but you still have the kind of free marketeer, uh, doctrinaire libertarianism, which says that, well, it's a private company, it can do whatever it wants. So Republicans, though, you know, I mean, uh, they have this sort of constitutionalist commitment to, to, to free speech. Um, a certain kind of Republican still thinks, uh, look, uh, oh, is there a boot stamped on my face? 
it's okay because the food inside belongs to a CEO as opposed to an agent of the government. So I'm willing to put up with that. Um, but that I should say that that's shifting on the right. I mean, increasingly, uh, uh, I think there are you know, a new generation of conservative thinkers emerging, of which I would class myself one, who say, no, look, the, the form, the private form, uh, the public-private distinction should not be made a fetish of when in reality what you're seeing is the, the transformation of a core American principle, a historic right of the American people into a mere paper right. It's there on paper, but uh, it, it doesn't have actuality, it doesn't have substance in reality. Because look, yes, it's true. If, if I wanted to, I, could, I live in midtown Manhattan and I could go to, downstairs to, to, to a street corner and kind of bang my drums and say, Hunter Biden is corrupt. Hunter Biden is corrupt. But you know, most people would just think I'm a nutter, right? If free speech means anything uh, today, it happens, it lives or dies on these platforms. So, uh, you know, and it's dying. Uh, is, the, is the short answer. So I think that, that a consensus has to emerge. One possibility is kind of going using, you know, monopoly laws, right? We have existing monopoly laws. Um, the, the sort of immense consolidation you see with some of these firms, where not only do you buy your groceries from them and your books, but your drones and your internet service providers and whatever else you can think of, that's a kind of con you know, conglomeration that, uh, that yeah, we, we have laws for going into the you know, late 19th and early 20th centuries intended to target those things. Um, and that could, could potentially unite, um, let's say uh, uh, progressives on the one hand, and I would say conservatives who part ways with the old free marketeer doctrine, doctrinaire orthodoxy could find common cause around that. But in the short term, I think uh, the prospects are grim. So Rob, let me, uh, we have a couple questions come in. It's not clear to a number of our participants today exactly what two -third, section 230 means. Could you just give a very short summary of what it's section 230 of what and how it came about. Sure, so um, the section 230 that we're talking about is section 230 of the 1996 Communications Decency Act, uh, which was uh, uh, obviously enacted by Congress, as I said during my main remarks, before there was a Facebook and before there was a Twitter. And it basically sought to govern, let's say internet bulletin boards, which were just then emerging. And the idea was that uh, uh, to shield such platforms from the normal liability that attends to being a publisher so, to, so as to encourage them to moderate or let's say censor frankly, you know, despicable content. So uh, as, as the name of the law suggests, Communications Decency Act, this was a time when, for example, combating pornography was a bipartisan commitment not yet abandoned by either party. Um, so that you, you know, Janet Reno's uh, Justice Department was still in the businesses of trying to root, root up um, online pornography. Um, and so it, it, it allowed them to act like publishers and therefore to censor violent threats or, you know, prurient content, but without being subject to the normal liabilities of a publisher like the New York Post. So if I, you know, God forbid, libel someone in the pages of the New York Post, the New York Post itself, you know, is subject to a liability suit by the potential defendant. But uh, uh, you know, you can you can libel someone on Twitter. You yourself is are, are individually liable, but the platform is not, and it's because it's shielded by the Communications Decency Act. But again, I, I don't think that was at a time when you could imagine, first of all, how pervasive these uh, companies were and how they would come to shape what we read, what we think, and that they would take that kind of good Samaritan carve out and turn it into a right to really begin to act like publishers uh, that both censor and publish their own opinions. Uh, since we are in a kind of a pro-Israel group, I'll tell you, if you look at the discover tab, it used to be called discover, or if you call it the search tab of Twitter, it's where Twitter kind of curates its own stories based on news from other tweeters, including mainly mainstream media outlets. And if you look at any Israel story, it will invariably be anti-Israel or kind of snidely critical of Israel. 
you'll never find one that's not kind of like that. I've, I've yet to run, run into one. So for example, at the height of the lockdown protests in Michigan, the framing of that was bad, right? Because these are Tea Party nuts, you know, uh, protesting. Then an anti-lockdown protest happens in Israel. The framing that Twitter does, again, not other outlets, Twitter itself does, is sort of like courageous dissidents defy Benjamin Netanyahu's lockdown, strict lockdown. So, and that goes to what Sean said. I mean, the, the staffers who populate these uh, are, are young activists they, they, who happen to work in, you know, uh, cushy jobs in, in Menlo Park, California, but they bring that politics to mind. So they, it, it, they don't even think about it. I think it's just part of the air they breathe in the same way that the, you know, the BBC is just kind of vaguely anti-Israel. It's just part of the air they breathe. Um, and um, that's fine, that's fine. But if they're gonna act like that, then they should, I would argue, they should have the liabilities of a publisher. They shouldn't have a, a special carve out. Thank you, thank you for clarifying. So we've had a couple of questions about this, and this goes to something you've just said. Uh, and I'd like Sean to comment on what we see uh, every day as a double standard, particularly as related, uh, related to Israel. And maybe as part of your answer, uh, you can, if you know, uh, describe the source of the rumor that somehow Israel is responsible for vaccinating uh, Palestinians from uh, from the pandemic. Sean? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead. Uh, thanks, Mark. I'll address the uh, latter question first. Uh, so the source, I think, and it speaks a lot to the media environment today, where it's just, it is an echo chamber. Uh, and I think it was even like that before Ben Rhodes uh, famously uh, used that term to describe what uh, he used to sell the Iran deal. There is very little independent fact checking. You can go up on Google and look up the Oslo Two Accords and find under the proper article, the section describing how the Palestinian Authority is responsible for healthcare in vaccinations. And indeed, if you are one of the few uh, journalists, because of course, many major outlets no longer have foreign bureaus, uh, that is in Israel, um, you are probably aware that there's been vaccinations going on for nearly three decades. Uh, it's a readily identifiable fact, it just takes Google. Uh, but Google, I think, uh, sadly, for many journals today is a bridge too far. Uh, they just, uh, you know, echo each other. You know, one person writes that this is the Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian Authority is saying that Israel is not providing vaccines and they don't do a deep dive into it. Somebody else cites that report and it just goes on and on, which is one of the reasons why our Israel office is so critical, because uh, Tamar deals with the wire services and that uh, in many cases uh, can work to prevent the story from propagating further, since wire services are what many newspapers rely on now for foreign reporting, uh, provided we get the corrections uh, in time, which often we do. But in this case, I think that the vaccination you have, or the vaccination libel, I think it could be called, um, longstanding anti-Semitic themes that are uh, that are underpinning all this, which is that uh, you know blood libel. And when you have a great analyst, Ricky Hollander, who's written about this on our site. This plays into preconceptions and preconceived narratives, uh, which is that Israel is at fault for everything with the Palestinians, um, and they are implicitly always to blame. And that, of course, would extend towards uh, vaccinations. Uh, so I think that that is the root of it. Um, and then you just have um, what you know, I mean, what you can call laziness. <laughs> there, the journalistic ethics and standards writ large, I think, as we've discussed and as Tamar highlighted, um, and so does Sorov, are not what they used to be. Um, there's numerous examples of this, but one that I would like to give is about two years ago, uh, two members of Congress, Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar, tried to go on a trip to Israel, which their itinerary labeled Palestine, and which they're going to meet with several BDS activists. Well, that trip was sponsored by an organization called MIFTA. MIFTA, among other things, has praised suicide bombers and claimed that Jews consume Christian blood. So it should be newsworthy that two members of Congress tried to go on this particular trip that was sponsored by a blood libeling anti-Semitic organization. I don't see how that's not front page news. Uh, and that information was provided to several news outlets. I even wrote to one of them, USA Today, when they filed a story and they omitted that bit saying, hey, are you guys going to include this? And uh, in that case, they declined. So that I think was a really particularly egregious uh, example of the state of journalism today uh, as it concerns Israel and as it concerns uh, liberal values as well. Uh, how is that not a news story? There's, there's no, there's no defense for it. That's uh, 
that's somewhat discouraging, but uh, when I close, I'll, I'll talk about what we can do. Uh, we did get a question about um, a uh, uh, not so positive, I'll say a negative, uh, a negative headline in the Los Angeles Times about uh, Israel's quote fawning. I'm sorry, U.S.'s fawning relationship with Israel. What can we do when we come across a headline like that? Absolutely. Well, I think well, one thing you can do if, if you're not already is uh, be involved with camera. We have a fantastic letter writing team. Our website has the tools to counter um, that. For example, I wrote a piece uh, about two years ago in response to a Washington Post item, which more or less said the same thing, that the Israel U.S.-Israel relationship has been one-sided with the U.S. Um, giving all uh, these adv advantages to Israel and Israel not reciprocating. Uh, and the truth, of course, is that that's absolutely not the case. Uh, Israel has been pressured by the U.S. significantly in the past, and Israel uh, is the only uh, U.S. ally to defeat two generations of Soviet uh, military, Soviet-equipped militaries on the battlefield, among many other things. So the relationship is, uh, is not as often described, and camera provides our members and our supporters with the tools to counter those narratives. And oftentimes we're successful. It's, it's, it's an ongoing battle every day. And great, thank you for that perspective. Um, our last question, uh, I wanna go back and some of our uh, listeners have raised this. I wanna go back to something that Nadine started with, and that is um, the old days when we had the Walter Cronkites and the Chet Huntleys and the David Brinkleys that uh, spoke to the American people and the people had confidence in them. Do any of our panelists see us ever getting back to a day when there will be another Walter Cronkite or Chet Huntley or David Brinkley? And uh, why don't we start with you, Sean, and then we'll ask uh, Tamar and Zora. Okay, uh, so yeah, I, I really don't want to sound uh, cynical and downcast, uh, but uh, I think that we're a long way from that. A long, long way for a variety of reasons. Uh, some of them cultural, and I, and I also do want to say, you know, in fairness, that uh, you, you don't want to mythologize, you know, Brinkley or Cronkite. They also had their share of errors and faults, but uh, certainly journalism is a far cry from what it was previously. And polling reflects that. There, there, there are very few industries which poll lower than Congress consistently. Uh, one of them is the, is the media writ large. And part of that, I think, and Tamar talked about this uh, quite well, is that the entire model of journalism has changed uh, in part because of uh, the digital age, social media, there's m multiple driving factors, uh, the radicalism at uh, many American universities or Western universities, I should say. Uh, so the model of journalism is no longer based on ad revenue, which of course, in that case, you have to keep opinions very separate from your uh, actual reporting. But now it's based on narrative in which it's often, if you open up say the Washington Post, Good luck telling which which one's the opinion page and which one's the reporting sometimes because everything is narrative driven. That is the new model. Uh, so I think we're a far cry from where we were, and I think it's going to be a long slog to get back uh, to get back to those days. Um, so, Rab, do you have a, a view? Hopefully, more optimistic. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I do want to briefly touch on why I think this is happening. And I think um, Sean identified the main one, which is the shift in the economic structure of the news business. Um, the New York Times used to, is still a national paper, but in purports to be, in a way that uh, you know, the Post isn't in some ways. I mean, we have a global voice, but it's still a New York City paper. I mean, the New York Post. The New York Times purports to be a national paper, but it increasingly plays to a very, very narrow slice of American society. Um, and the reason for that is, is declining ad revenues, uh, what they primarily now make their money on. And the New York Times is cash flush. It does really well, um, but it's based on subscriptions, not based on uh, uh, ad revenues that make it that allow it to be uh, kind of guide its readers as opposed to just following whatever the, its its subscribers say on Twitter. That's shifted. So now they, you know, uh, there's this enormous economic pressure for them to follow their 
uh, uh, readers. And if the readers are outraged about some story they didn't like, you know, the, the, the journalist gets fired, you know, or the op-ed gets retracted, you know, even if it's a U.S. senator like Tom Cotton or he was a, you know, uh, a fairly liberal, I would say, and a former a friend of mine and a former colleague of mine, Barry Weiss, you know, um, gets put under so much pressure because she annoys the subscribers who are ever more woke. Um, what, what are the factors, you know, that the university, uh, you know, trains people, you know, in, in marinates them in a kind of prefabricated ideology in which there are oppressors and, and, and oppressed peoples. And, and it's very sort of uh, 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 superficial, but it's a, it's a real training and ideology that a lot of young people get whatever path in life they take. And then the, I don't know if you've seen this, but there's this kind of campus like atmosphere at the, at the media outlets themselves where, you know, the, the, higher up editors who are typically middle-aged and kind of old school liberals live in absolute terror of the younger wokesters, the 25 year olds, you know, who if they see an article in their own paper, they disagree with, it's not that just that they disagree, they have to like go online and say, that made me feel unsafe. I feel unsafe in my workplace. Now they're like working in Midtown and living in Midtown and <laughs> there's no threat to their safety, but for, you know, the idea is threatening. So those are the factors shaping all of it. And so I don't see um, uh, uh, an immediate shift back to the Walter Cronkite age, which by the way, that also, you know, kind of was enforcing a kind of orthodoxy, but it was just more widely shared that orthodoxy at least. And, and it was, the society as a whole was less fractured than I think. Uh, but regardless, I think that the narrowness of the mainstream outlets is creating a kind of a thousand flowers bloom where lots of re young reporters are going off, young and inexperienced ones, who can't fit into the mainstream institutions are doing their own thing on these kind of subscription-based services like Substack, you know, Glenn Greenwald from Glenn Greenwald to Barry Weiss to Jesse Single, you name it, they all have their own Substacks. And I think there's a, personally, I think there's a business opportunity, which, uh, uh, you know, for someone who can kind of take that model of the Substacks, but also combine it with some of the values of the older journalism world, because, whatever thought pops into Matthew Iglesias' head is not necessarily intelligence or factually sound. So he needs, as a, as a writer, he needs some guidance, but not, let's not return to the rigidness of the old institutions, which have now become well settled world, world, world. So kind of combining those two, but at the end of the day, you know, truth has to prevail. And so, you know, if these institutions won't serve it, someone else will. Thank you. Do either of the other panelists want to add uh, and I'd ask if, if anybody, any of the panel, feels that there's one uh, new source that's fairer than any other of the new sources, particularly as related to Israel. Um, I would just say that the most important thing to do if you want to get accurate understanding is to read as many different news sources as possible, um, because there isn't one media outlet that stands out as a a shining example of, of always accurate coverage. Um, I, I know that I have a great deal of respect for the editor of the Times of Israel and his commitment to getting the facts state straight, that's David Horowitz. And when we contact the newspaper about factual issues, they're very uh, forthcoming. Um, I want to loop back to, uh, to Barry Weiss, the op-ed editor, of uh, the New York Times who stepped down, uh, Sorab mentioned, uh, mentioned her case. And just to reinforce that uh, what Sorab and, and Sean said, it does not look like we are ever going to get back to the Walter Cronkite traditional standards of journalism. And Barry's criticism of the paper, she was speaking from the side of op-eds, but I think it really equally applies to the news side as well. Um, she grew up in a generation like I did, believing that and being taught that journalism is the first draft of history. And that's been turned upside down on its head uh, with the new belief that um, journalism is, is not about uh, finding truth in a process of collective discovery, but that a few journalists, uh, uh, elites, um, have the, the truth and it's their job to, to tell it to the um, to the public. And in doing so, it, it disregards facts, shoehorning facts into its preconceived narratives uh, and, and reporting from within a very narrow frame. 
Um, and in, in this kind of climate, we see that ideology takes over for tra traditional standards of journalism. And I just wanna give a really, I know we spoke about so many uh, cases and examples, but a really stark example from this past summer of how woke ideologies or whatever our ideologies are, are the popular um, uh, atmosphere of the news organization take control above all else. And that was a national public radio did an interview with a Palestinian chef over the summer in which he referred to three Israeli cities within Israel's green line. So not in any disputed territory whatsoever, Nazareth, Akko and Haifa as part of modern day Palestine. And I wrote to NPR because this is a, a, a publicly funded uh, network which says in its standards that it has a commitment to getting the facts right about the smallest detail of reality. And the ombuds uh, department refused to correct saying that it was a cooking show and the political uh, geopolitical realities weren't important even though the introduction to the section said that, that it was actually important as the backdrop of this cookbook. Um, and in contrast, uh, I was interested to see, okay, if this isn't correction worthy, what is correction worthy at National Public Radio? And I was shocked to find that within days of this refusal to correct, they had correct corrected a program about a new television drama called P Valley. And the protagonist in that drama, fictional drama, is a gender fluid strip show, uh, strip joint owner. Um, and the correction was that uh, they had referred to the wrong gender pronoun. So here NPR was willing to very eager to co correct the gender pronoun preference of a fictional character and refused to correct the basic factual geopolitical reality uh, for hundreds of thousands of residents within Israel, not Palestinian territories. So I think that really points to the direction which we're going, but I was so, um, I, I think what Sorab said is so important in terms of the possibility for a new way out. We're not going to return to what, what was at one time, that's gone. But the option of Substack and, I, I, it, it, uh, and, and bringing traditional values of truth, but in a different platform and in a different way, I think that, you know, whatever, Substack is just the, the detail, but wherever we go, I think that, that um, as Sean referenced, Winston Churchill's quotes, truth will prevail. And you know, tomorrow night, Jews around the world will be sitting down to celebrate Purim. We'll be reading from the book of Esther. And uh, I believe that book contains the first uh, recorded instance of the anti-Semitic libel against Jews of dual loyalty. Haman tells Achashverosh, there is a dispersed people living in the kingdom and they have their own laws and they don't abide by the king's laws. And this is really the earliest iteration of the dual loyalty charge. Um, and as a result of that defamation and demonization, the order for genocide went out all across the land um, in very far flung kingdom. And the case seemed hopeless and lost. And in the end, um, the, the truth got out and the decree was reversed. So I think we should take this to heart um, and, and as Saurabh said, there are means of fighting back. It's going to be a long um, and difficult. It's not going to be easy, but there are uh, means of, of doing so. And I think Marv, you're going to get to that. Also. I'm going to get to that right now. I'm going to get to that right. Terrific. Now. So that's a terrific entree. I give it over to you. So thank you. Thank you for the for the cue. So first, uh, thank you to our panel for sharing your experiences and and insights. It was terrific, and we could go on for several hours. But as our viewers can see, keeping the press fair and factual is a battle. Uh, one of the panelists mentioned that. It's a daily battle. It's done article by article, column by column, headline by headline. But the good news is each of us can play a role, an important role, and we each can have an impact. First, we can write to the press. We can get letters to the editor or op-eds printed in our local or national newspapers. We can challenge editorials or columns that are a negative or an error. We can get factual errors corrected. Let me just share, or take one minute and share a personal story. During the 2014 Gaza war, I was cruising the internet and saw an article of, by Reuters and the headline was absolutely horrible about some IDF activity. And I couldn't believe it. I opened the article 
And there was nothing in the text of the article, nothing that supported the headline. Now we all know that headline writers take liberties and they don't necessarily come from the wire service per se, but I sent an email to Reuters with the link to the article and within one hour, within one hour, the headline was totally changed. So every individual can have a real impact. In addition to letter writing, you can also do more. You can become a supporter of camera. You saw a sample of the work that camera analysts do every day. And this is only a small slice of what goes on in camera. Camera provides the information to the press to get corrections and gets literally hundreds of corrections per year. Camera provides us with the information we need to demand corrections and get apologies for transactions. Camera needs your support. Please go to camera.org and make a donation today. This is critically important work and your support can and will make a difference. It's camera.org. Thank you once again to our panel. Thank you to our viewers for joining us today. And we wish everyone a safe and healthy year. And we look forward to when we can get back in person. Thank you.